Hello, welcome back to theCUBE here, the NYSC, the CUBE and the NYSC Wired connection with the CUBE and Brian Bauman and the NYSC team is here bringing you another media week. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE's, our East Coast location, and we got a great guest here, Sar Yakovitz, who's the CEO, founder of Augury, doing very, very well. Um, entrepreneur in the action, great to have you on here. We try to get your logo up on the big um, <laughs> cubes, they call them, which uh -huh. is not related to the cube, our cube, but it's their yeah. cubes. Um, great to have you on, on here. Thanks on for having cube. me. We'll get this done next time, don't we? We'll, we'll get that next time. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the company that you founded. I want to get into some of the, the work you're doing because um, you're applying AI to a real kind of like what I call meat and potatoes use case, real business. Yes. You guys deal with a lot of manufacturing, a lot of companies involved in, you know, that just run brick and mortar type businesses. So give a quick overview of what you guys do. Yeah, so Augury, we, we work with the largest manufacturing companies uh, to help them make their production lines more reliable, more productive, more sustainable. Um, as an example, today, 20% um, of Fortune 500 companies are Augury customers, right? So the top food and beverage, pharma, CPG, chemicals, et cetera. Um, and we work with their executives to see how we can infuse AI into every layer of the manufacturing stack. Um, I would say at the most basic level, uh, we listen to machines, and based on the noise, we can tell you what's wrong with them. Uh, so we have um, a, a full stack solution. We actually have our own hardware sensor that we physically install on a machine. We measure certain element, uh, aspects like vibration and temperature, magnetic emissions of the, of the machine to tell you in real time if you have any malfunctions developing uh, so you can stop them before they happen. And as a result, I'll give an example from one of the largest uh, food companies where last year we helped them avoid 4,000 hours of downtime, which equal 10 million pounds of, of food product that we're able to manufacture, like snacks, right? And to them, this is a, you know... Um, Huge cost it, savings right and, there. And, and also top line revenue increase because every potato chip they manufacture, they know how to sell, right? So how do we leverage AI to have clear Im business impacts on, on, on our customers? Sorry, so Bottom instrumentation line. provides a lot of data. Mm. Instruments do data. Obviously, they're throwing off a lot of data. It's a great IoT-like example. How do you guys make sense of that? You ingest the data. Get, take us through some of the, the working mechanisms. You got a sensor, mm. you connect to the devices. What happens next? So today we take data from two different sources. We have our own sensing platform, the kind of our own hardware. Um, and we also can uh, ingest data from the existing systems that are on the production line, right? Mm -hmm. It's called the manufacturing execution system or the historian. And then we can couple the mechanical data, how is the machine behaving, with the operational data of what am I telling the machine to do? How am I operating the machine? And, and this way we can increase the, not just the, the uptime of the machine avoiding malfunctions, but also reduce waste, reduce energy consumption, you know, in, improve yield and throughput. Yeah. Um, a lot to say here, but for, for our own hardware, you know, to me, we, we'll talk about AI quite a bit today, right? Yeah. AI is only as good as the data set yeah. that it's trained on, on, a model is. And we basically standardize our own data set through our own hardware. And what that means, you know, we, we, today we have over half a billion hours of machines that we've monitored. And we can use and leverage that data in order to continuously improve our algorithms, yeah. create new types of insights, increase coverage, yeah. et cetera. You know, we love when they hear the noise on the floor. Yeah. It means a big trade is going down. You know, it brings back the old NYSE. Whenever I hear people yelling, <laughs> I love, yeah, big trade. Maybe someone made some money, cha-ching. Let's talk about um, when you guys were founded. Share, how long ago did you start the company? Yeah. How many years ago? When was it formed? Yeah, so we started 13 years ago. Two yeah. co-founders, myself and my partner. Um, we actually met at the university, and, and I, both of us are engineers. And I focused on speech recognition kind of in, in my studies. And when you think about it, the problem that we solve is very similar. Yeah. You listen to a machine, you take an audio wave, and you try to find meaning inside of it, but instead of searching for words, you search for malfunctions. Yeah. That's kind of how we started, yeah. and we also have kind of affinity to, to, to machines in the industrial space. So started kind of talking to factories, to commercial buildings, OEMs of these machines, to understand what is the, kind of, what is the best path to market. And we've been at it for over a decade now. You know, it's interesting because you have seen that first wave of machine learning, supervised, unsupervised yeah. machine learning, predictive analytics. Gen AI is a new category, it doesn't go away. The old categories of predictive and machine learning ride into generative AI. Talk about, talk about that dynamic. When you had that Gen AI moment, 
Yeah. When was it that you said, hey, things are generated, which yeah. is not a programmable thing. That's something that's making use of the data. Talk about that experience and what that's done for your business. Yeah, I think that's a, first of all, I fully agree. We started with statistical models and neural networks, deep learning. Now we have uh, transformers and large language models, et cetera. At the end of the day, from a customer perspective, right, what we understand is, you know, AI is a tool, it's not an outcome, right? Yeah. So let's focus on what is the business outcome yeah. that you want to drive, yeah. and then what is the right tool set in order to achieve it, right? And, and what we're seeing specifically in the industrial market is that there is no room for mistakes, right? Um, yeah. I, I tell the team, at the end of the day, we don't sell sensors and we don't sell AI, we sell trust. And if our customers want to see the, the behavioral change, the, the cultural change and impact, if the maintenance technician or the operator doesn't trust the system, they go back to their old habits, yeah. right? Now we're starting to do seeing hallucination into the process, right? There's a certain Which does element not foster of, trust, by the way. Exactly, yeah. so moving from generative AI to reliable AI, I don't care what technology you use, I just want it to be reliable. Yeah. Um, so there, there is definitely a room for, for yeah. generative in yeah. our world, right? Um, less maybe on the diagnostic side, more on the user interface, right? So we're seeing more natural conversation. I want yeah. to be able to ask a question and then get all the data to support that answer, right? So we do have gener generative yeah. AI kind of um, components in our platform, yeah. as well as internally kind of, I would say that there's a lot of benefits we've already seen. You, you know, sorry, when you're talking, it just floods my brain with all this IOT conversations that we've had over the past decade. Industrial IOT, whether it's manufacturing, critical infrastructure, now add in security, because we do a lot of um, conversations with security pros on either threat hunting, threat detection, mm. just for recovery and resilience, being yeah. resilient, right? So this idea of trust is huge, yes. and this idea of it can't fail mm -hmm. is a critical system. Critical okay. systems need trust, good automation and delegation, you got to have um, good governance. Uh -huh. And so uh, these are business concepts mm. applied now to technology. The interesting thing is the neural network format is not, it's a format where machines take over. Yes. And that's where the scale comes in. So talk about how you're starting to see that permeate into your customers because uh, I was at, um, having a conversation with a security pro who's an, a an AI engineer and he says, and he was very pragmatic, his security people are, are very pragmatic. I'm sure your customers are too. He, <laughs> he said, uh, Gener AI, it's just another application. And he's not wrong, actually. Yeah, it's, Gener tool. It's, it's just yeah. another thing. Yeah. It's got to go through AppSec review, goes through these processes. So trusting in this governance piece of, okay, it's vetted. Yeah. Now I got to put it into production. Mm -hmm. These are the same concepts that were pre Gen AI. Correct. What's different now with this new Gen AI? What are some of those constraints? What are the challenges and opportunities with generative AI that's different that will have an impact to the customer environment? Yeah, so, so first of all, I, fu I fully agree with kind of the, your assessment. And you know, I mentioned we're, we're kind of uh, infusing AI into every layer of the stack and, and we mean it. Uh, by, by that I mean that the, our, this is a new sensor we just launched a couple of months ago. It's the industry first uh, sensor that's capable of running edge AI, running neural networks on the edge. And then the whole network architecture is also infused by AI yeah. and self-healing networks. And because reliability of the network, the safety and security of the network is as important as, as a result, yeah. right? Um, to your question, in our conversations with executives, in, in senior executives in manufacturing, what, we've, what they've noticed is that the tools that they used to have in the toolbox are no longer available. Meaning they can't just offshore to China anymore because of geopolitical issues. Yeah. They can't and supply chain risks. Supply chain risk, and they can't hire more people because they can't find more people, talented, uh, skilled yeah. talent. Um, they can't raise prices because of the economy, and, and now we have sustainability kind of pressure from reg regulators or the yeah. consumers. So they, they fundamentally need to think differently about how they run a production line or a factory, right? So we, we, we had a, an industry uh, survey recently and we saw that 83% of leaders have increased their AI budget and, and, and spending compared to last year. So how are things changing? I think there's an openness to reimagining yeah, yeah. the org structure, yeah. the different roles on a production line, the processes and procedures, and infusing, again, kind of technology yeah. into the day-to-day -day of the frontline workers yeah. to increase their productivity. Tech is not a service entity for the business, it is the business. It has and to be. And it's interesting because the, the mindset shift culturally 
is hits both sides of the ledger, cost and revenue. Mm -hmm. Because you get cost efficiencies from productivity and also hard cost gains, yeah. as well as enabling the app to be a better service vehicle for revenue generating. And, and you get agility. And agility. agility is very crucial, especially with all these surprises around supply chain Give an example and of agility for customers <laughs> that you've worked with or how Gen AI could render itself as an agility value proposition. So, as, as an example, um, I have a, a ton of them, but just one, one example, you know, we, we, we have, we look at machine health, which is the mechanical health of the machine, and look at process health. Yeah. How are you running the machines, right? Today, one of the, you know, if, if I'm a manufacturer and I need, due to the economy, I need to shut down a factory and I need to move production from here over there, how quickly can I do that, right? How quickly can I train this team, which yeah. am, maybe have never manufactured this product line, on a new product, right? So if I've already digitized the knowledge, I digitized the, the, the operational envelope, right? If I can shorten uh, the turnaround time between product A and product B, I gain this flexibility of turning on and off production lines, right? If we look at a more kind of macro view, yeah. and, and you have a very technical kind of <laughs> audience, right? To me, one of the most uh, maybe ironic uh, outcomes of the last few decades is that yeah. all the goodness we've seen in product R&D around agile and around, uh, you know, we call it feature squads or cross-functional empowered teams, all came from manufacturing. It all came from the Toyota production systems uh, system and then lean manufacturing and lean thinking. But in order to do so, in order to bring product and R&D closer or sales and marketing closer, we had to invent a trillion dollar industry called DevOps or RevOps, right? But the industrial market never went through that same change in how the teams are structured. Yeah. And now it's an opportunity to leverage the same tools or similar tools to bring them back to the originating yeah. kind of yeah. industry so they can also get the same It's a the renaissance for benefits. manufacturing, it really is. Yes. I mean, Agentic App's going to be uh, very helpful. I want to get your thoughts on um, um, agents and what's coming around the corner. Assuming things are, are, are shifting in the platform, the mindset's shifting, domain expertise is huge. Correct. Okay, a big part of what we're seeing in the enterprise. The industrial edge even more um, uh, compelling to have mm -hmm. domain expertise because you have, have plat distributed computing understanding and end-to-end -end workflows around mm -hmm. data. Okay, so you can't just throw AI at that. You can't just say train my enterprise because the domain experts mm -hmm. involved have to know the process. Correct. So you have to do process mining and understand the nuances of the knobs and switches that have to get turned. I'm um, using that as a metaphor to oversimplify, but there are specific things that are Correct. unique to every workflow. Yeah, 100%. The importance of domain expertise in this horizontally scalable data layer with the vertical specialization around the domain. Yeah, so I think, if, if, first of all, we pride ourselves in having, uh, on our team, we have the, the AI data scientists and, and, and algo developers, as well as field technician and solution architects and reliability experts and process engineers, because you can't have one without the other, yeah. right? To, to really be successful. And when you look at the domain expertise, it goes from how do I know which data to collect? Two years ago, I, when <laughs> I started collecting data, which data did I start collecting and can I leverage yeah. it today? And then when you train the models, you know, data is only as is only good if it's also yeah. tagged correctly, right, and verified. So how do I train the, yep. how do I infuse the domain experts when I train the data? And also post implementation, I still need that, exp every once in a while I do need that expert verification because we cannot be wrong. We can't give the wrong recommendation. So how do we, throughout the call it customer journey and product development journey, we have these domain experts sitting kind of in the same room mm -hmm. with the technology R&D engineers. Take me through the integration because when you, when you instrument um, a line, you got to integrate. Um, and so you got to connect back office mm -hmm. with front office, there's cost revenue, so there's an integration play here. Well, um, what's your reaction to that? How would you talk about integrating your system yeah. to be fully capable of unlocking that value from the data? So one of the biggest challenges in the industry today is the you know, we talk about data lakes, but yeah, in reality yeah. we have data swamps yeah. um, or data tar pits, depending how uh, kind of grim you want to be. You suck into the tar yeah, pit, a yeah, bunch of get... dinosaurs in there, exactly. you know, like fossils. So, so when, when <laughs> IT fossils. It, that, that, that is a, a huge challenge, because every factory, uh, even if it's been, uh, even if they use the same machines by the same OEMs, 
they, yeah, they had a different system integrator that customized it, et cetera. So our first approach for what we call machine health has been to just create our own data set. We don't need to integrate into anything. We come in, we super glue a sensor on your machine, yeah. a, a few sensors on your machine, connect them to the cloud, and we basically bypass all of the legacy systems, working with IT, working with security, right? But bypass all of the legacy systems and create that direct connection. Yeah. Um, so the time to value could so be- So agility kicks in, your speed. Time to value could be as quick as one day. We had a customer where we deployed wow. on, this year we were deployed on April 24th, on April 25th, we found a malfunction. Their technicians fixed it, and they had 1.5x ROI for the full annual program. Yeah. Uh, just you know, by the speed of which we, we That's work. That's an easy sell. So, Cut the line when suppliers are standing there saying we have AI, right? Exactly. Just focus on business impact, not on the tools. So our exactly. really great conversation. I want to get my final question. I want to ask you is. Um, you know, digital twins have been hot in manufacturing because mm. you can create a twin, look at process improvement, efficiency, do simulations, all great. But now the term is broader now because you can move beyond manufacturing and, and put a digital twin for any process. Yeah. The concept, it's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation because manufacturing is different than say marketing yeah. department or sales or whatever function. Mm -hmm. We believe that, um, the Cube Research believes and we believe that digital twins will emerge now with Genova AI because you can do the simulations, exactly. you can do some efficiency identification with AI, then bring it in versus mm -hmm. deploying it in and then going, what happened? You can do both, Yeah. but people are leaning to getting use cases, understand what's possible, and then go immediately to a digital twin mm -hmm. to get data to figure out what data is the best, Correct. iterate on that in the twin environment, and then move it in as a first class citizen. Exactly. So first of all, I typically try to shy away from uh, kind of uh, vague terms, right? Yep. Um, and we saw it with IoT in the beginning, yeah. then AI, and, and, and kind of digital twins are, are, to me, you ask five different people what yeah. they mean, you get 10 different answers, yeah, exactly. right? Um, I think the key word you said is simulation, right? If I have the ability to, to build a simulator, based on a specific subsystem or subprocess that I know, which is similar between industries, between companies. Yep. And then I take your specific historical data, I run it on the simulator, and now I can predict in real time the um, changes you want to make on the line or the process. To me, that is a digital twin, right? So the ability to leverage yep. technologies like reinforcement learning, right? Or maybe transformers yep. as well to build that simulator, that is going to change everything. Right? Yeah. That's what we're doing on the process health side. as Outcome well, as driven, it. too. I mean, the ultimate test is, does the outcome get changed? Can, right? can, because that's yeah. the goal. And you know, one analogy we, we look at in our industry is, it's very similar to uh, driving, navigation in, in cars, right? We all used to have um, maps, paper maps, and then you before you go on the trip, you paint the route you want to go, and. If you make a mistake and uh, take a wrong turn, then good luck trying to figure it out while you're driving. And then we have kind of uh, the first generation of GPS devices that could help you go from point A to point B, but they didn't know if there was a traffic jam or a road closure or an accident. And only when we got kind of Waze or Google Maps or Apple Maps, now we have this kind of real-time turn-by-turn navigation that is aware of what's happening around you. That's kind of where we need to bring the industry yeah. to. Right? If the humidity in the room changed and I'm a baking bread, it's going to have kind of huge yeah. impact on the yeah. quality of the product. So yeah. I want to be aware of that and change the temperature of the oven in real time. I need that simulator, right? I need that real time term to navigation. So our great conversation, love the data swamp, data tar pit, I'm going to use that. Uh, I'll <laughs> reference you, I'll give you credit for that one. It's a good one, because I can throw the word dinosaur in there, because there's a lot of dinosaurs <laughs> in IT. Um, but what's next for you guys as you embark on the new ed edge devices that are going to grab data? I'm sure they're going to get smaller faster. They're going to have soon processors on them, multi-threaded capabilities, ability to co-locate data. You're sending mm -hmm. data, you're receiving data, you're instrumenting things intelligently. What's next for you guys in the company? What's that next hill you're going to climb? What's yeah. the vision? So we started in, in we started as a predictive maintenance company, right? And then we understood that the problem that we solve is not really a maintenance problem, right? It's a sustainability problem, a supply yeah. chain resiliency problem, and et cetera. So we, we went kind of broader into what we call machine health. And over time, a couple of years ago, we said, okay, even this is not ambitious enough. Now we, our customers are asking us to also go into the process and the operation side. Yeah. So we understand that there is a bigger picture of what we call production uh, health, or we want to build the operating system of the AI-driven factory. 
And there are different facets of manufacturing that we want to include the data sets around machines and processes, which is where we are today. Also include the workforce, maybe sustainability, yeah. and other elements. So how do we grow and to become more of a, a partner yeah. to our customers that helps them address all of their AI and digital use cases? It's interesting that you were, use the word production. I like how you use that generically because everything is production when it's running something, yeah, right? Yeah, this is a production, right? <laughs> we're running uh, services, professional yeah. services and you know, technical services and machine services. Yeah. AI is a data service, right? I mean, that's what you got going on. Great stuff. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. I really Thanks appreciate this me. conversation. Again, Digital Twin is concept, it's a data problem, governance. At the end of the day, the outcomes is will, will, will stand the test of time. It's an exciting time, of course. The Cube is bringing it to you here at the NYSE studio. Here's the Cube's new East Coast access point. It's our point of presence. It's our media infrastructure connecting Silicon Valley and New York City, Wall Street to, 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 to the Valley and technology. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. Thanks for watching.